Welcome to repairing a twin cylinder Stuart 5A steam engine. Part 3. This is a pair of Stuart 5A steam engines coupled together as one unit and they make a knocking noise when running. This episode shows how to remove the eccentric sheaves. Up until now this series was about fault finding, but now it's gone past that into a repair job. I don't know what the problem is, and now I have to do certain things to make it work properly. In the previous episode I removed an aluminium coupling from the crankshaft with great difficulty and unfortunately the job is going to get more difficult because the eccentric sheaves are a real tight fit on the crankshaft. I tried another hub puller that I have and it didn't even make an impression on them. Had I have carried on they would have been damaged by the hub puller. What I'm doing here is disconnecting the eccentric rods from the expansion link. And after doing that, there's now a little bit more room to work, as the eccentric sheaves are quite isolated and look very lonely sat there on the crankshaft. I'm using my Proxon mini blowtorch to heat up the eccentric sheaves, just to see if they are actually stuck to the shaft using Loctite. But after doing this for a while, it appears that they are not. And to make matters worse, the eccentric sheaves are held onto the crankshaft using two grub screws, which is very unusual, you only really need one. And to compound the problem, one of the grub screws goes into the slot on the crankshaft, and this will actually deform the slot in the crankshaft and make things even tighter. Because these eccentric sheaves are actually eccentrically mounted on the crankshaft, which is fairly obvious, I can only use a hub puller with two arms. The good news though is that it's working fine. As both of the eccentric sheaves slide along the crankshaft, one of them starts to be a bit looser. But then, when they get to the end of the crankshaft, they both tighten up again. And that's because they're hitting the part of the crankshaft that was damaged by the grub screw on the aluminium fitting that was originally on there. As I'm working on this engine, the vibe that I get is that it was built by a very competent engineer who was probably more used to working on much larger engines than this one. Even the grub screws were tightened so much that they damaged the crankshaft. The screw thread wasn't long enough to remove the final eccentric sheave, so I put a socket in between the end of it and the crankshaft, and then suddenly, off came the sheave. This entire job took quite a while. I was very methodical and very careful because I didn't want to damage either the cast iron eccentric sheaves or the steel crankshaft itself. I cleaned up the sheaves using a piece of wet and dry sandpaper and some WD-40. I would at this stage like to add that I don't normally do this on the engine's baseboard. Here's a crankshaft minus the sheaves, and the worst case scenario is that the crankshaft has also been drilled to locate the position for the grub screws. This is not good news because the indentations are in the wrong place. As I demonstrated in the previous episode, neither of these engines will work unless they're connected together. And it always puzzled me why a twin cylinder engine the size of this didn't give as much power as I thought it would. And that's because the engine was fighting itself every revolution. Here I'm doing a bit of measuring. I can't decide whether this is imperial or metric. The calipers tell me that it's 18.01 millimetres or 18 millimetres. I would think on the drawing it's probably imperial at 11 sixteenths. But it doesn't really matter though, the engine's fine, the bearings are a great fit and they're not worn at all. The only problem I have is the fact that the eccentric sheaves are far too tight to go onto this shaft without being tapped into place with a hammer. And this makes it very difficult to adjust the position of the sheaves once they're pushed down the crankshaft into the position that they need to be. What I'm going to do first is repair the damage to the crankshaft caused by these fittings. I'm using a process known as draw filing and I'm using a very fine needle file. With this needle file I can actually feel the damage around the edge of the machine keyway. Once I cleaned up the damage around the slot in the crankshaft I thought I would leave it at that because the crankshaft is very true. Using my bench mounted Proxon motor tool with the grinder fitted I very very carefully smoothed out the inside edge of each of the eccentric sheaves. I can only recommend this if you've had some experience at doing this sort of thing. A reamer would have been a better idea, but unfortunately I do not possess an 11 16 reamer. 
Here's one of the eccentric sheaves that now fits on the crankshaft, and I'm just about to do the second one. Please note it is not a rattle fit, it's still quite a firm fit, but slideable on the crankshaft, and this is what you need for fine adjustment. Here I'm using the needle file to clean up the damaged area a little bit more, near the end of the crankshaft, where the aluminium part was fitted. I don't know anything about the history of this engine. Was it used in a boat? I don't know. If the aluminium part that I removed in the last episode was the propeller driver, then it wasn't really well fitted to the shaft with a single small grub screw. Anyway, that's all over and done with now. I'm very pleased to say that the eccentrics are a perfect fit on the crankshaft. So that's one side done. I'm hoping when I get to the other side, it will be easier than this. This is a can of standard thinners, cellulose thinners or lacquer thinner as you call it in the USA. And I'm using this to clean the parts. I filled this plastic box, which is actually made of polythene, with the cellulose thinners. When I go into the workshop tomorrow, all of the old oil and grime should have been dissolved. I'm moving the container of cellulose thinners into the outer part of the workshop because it's very smelly. I need to remove the flywheel from this end of the engine, so then I will be able to fit it at the other end of the engine. This is how I'm removing the key, with a screwdriver using different parts of the screwdriver at different times of the operation. And thankfully, no violence was required. It just tapped out very smoothly. And with very gentle persuasion, the flywheel left the crankshaft really easily. In this clip, I'm checking the fit of the flywheel on the other end of the crankshaft, and it's fine. It's a perfect fit, not slack and not tight, just perfect. The key, though, is not a good fit. It's still hitting some obstruction on the inside edge of the keyway. A bit more needle filing should remove it. You can actually see the damage, it's on the right hand side of the slot. A key should be tight, in as much as it should put even pressure against the crankshaft and the flywheel. It should not stick in some damage in the slot. After a bit of needle filing, I thought it was a good idea to try it. The key fits OK until it hits the damage, but it's not much, so by tapping it very gently with a soft hammer, the key can be fitted without event. And as you can see, starting with the screwdriver and finishing off with the end of the soft hammer, it can also be removed. I don't like to do half-hearted jobs, so a little bit more work with the file and some lubrication means that the key fits perfectly in the slot. As you can see, it pushes in OK. If I tap it all the way in, it will tighten up. The main thing is though, the flywheel is connected to the crankshaft and it's firm without any slop. The knocking that you can hear when I rotate the crankshaft is not the flywheel, it's the big end that's worn. Now I'm going to reassemble the valve gear at this end of the engine. So by the time you see the engine again, the valve gear will be fitted and I can show the timing procedure. If the engine runs OK when I refit the valve gear, I will then have a much closer look at the big end bearing. That's it for this episode. Stay safe, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.